Good afternoon, everyone. It is uh, a real pleasure to be here with Prime Minister Karens uh, in Canada. Uh, you welcomed me, Christianis, to Latvia just a few months ago back in March, uh, and I'm honored to be able to welcome you here to Canada in such a beautiful sunny day. Um, it was a really good productive meeting we had uh, it just now. We reaffirmed the strong and deep ties between our countries. We're both steadfast supporters of Ukraine, and we discussed further military support that we can uh, work on together, but also offer. Le Canada et la Lettonie partagent des valeurs fondées sur la liberté, la démocratie et la primauté du droit. La Lettonie et les pays baltes ressentent l'ombre de leurs voisins, la Russie, mais ils continuent de tous maintenir un rempart protégeant leur démocratie et celle de l'Europe de l'Est. Today, Prime Minister Karins and I also discussed how we can continue strengthening NATO's deterrence and defense measures along Europe's eastern flank. As you know, Canada leads the NATO battle group based in Latvia, which I had the chance to visit back in March at Camp Adadzi. Currently, 695 Canadian Armed Forces women and men are deployed in Latvia. Today, I am very pleased to announce that we will be deploying a general and six staff officers to NATO's multinational division North headquarters in Adadzi. They'll be part of a first-of-its-kind unit in the Northern Baltic Sea region to help plan, coordinate, and integrate regional military activities. It'll serve as a continued and important part of our enhancements to NATO's defense and deterrence capabilities. This is something uh, Latvia had actually asked Canada to provide to continue assisting in the region. We talked about it a fair bit uh, just a few months ago. So together, through our collective strength, we will continue to defend against threats to democracy and global stability. Over the weekend, I was in Ukraine, where I got to see firsthand what attacks against democracy and global stability look like. I saw the devastation of Irpin, with homes destroyed, with neighborhoods battered. Il est clair que des crimes de guerre ont été commis et que le blâme revient entièrement à Poutine. Pendant ma visite, J'ai constaté la résilience et le courage des Ukrainiens. Ils se battent avec une férocité qui a inspiré le monde entier. Ils sont moins nombreux, mais ils défendent leur patrie avec énormément de succès. Les Russes les ont clairement sous-estimés. Despite the dark and brutal realities of war, Romania, uh, Ukrainians continue to seek a bright, free, democratic future. We will, together, collectively, be there to support Ukrainians as they defend themselves against Putin's illegal invasion. And we will be there as the country re rebuilds afterwards. Christianus, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for everything you and your partners do to defend, uh, to defend Europe, to defend democracy. Ensemble, nos pays vont continuer de défendre nos valeurs communes. It's very good to see you here today, my friend. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Justin. It's wonderful to be here in your wonderful country, in your wonderful capital, on such a warm, if not hot, uh, sunny day. Uh, your role as a prime minister and your role as, as, as the leader of Canada, the leadership role, is very highly valued, uh, not only uh, in, in my country, throughout the Baltics, and in Europe as a whole. Uh, we speak about the basic values that we share, freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. But what's important is that we're willing to back up uh, our support of these values with uh, strength and might, if necessary. And the world, unfortunately, has changed that we see that we, it no longer is enough to simply speak about our way of life, but we have to be willing to invest uh, into uh, increasing our military capability to, def to uh, actually defend uh, our way of life uh, indeed. Uh, in Latvia, uh, as you know, we are currently investing 2.2% uh, of our GDP on defense. 
We've made a decision together as, as, as our neighbors, the Estonians and Lithuanians, to move that in the next coming three years to 2.5%. So we are certainly investing in our own defense. But we also uh, fully understand and appreciate that our defense uh, uh, works as part of a collective defense. And Canada's leading role in the EFP in Latvia has been crucial. Now, the decision that you've taken today uh, of uh, uh, further strengthening the multinational division north, uh, which is uh, currently uh, based in Riga, uh, is a very, very big uh, decision indeed. Because in the Baltics, uh, what we see is the proportional response to Putin's war in Ukraine is, uh, and this is what we need to uh, discuss and, and, and agree upon politically in Madrid uh, in the coming, in about uh, a month and a half, is uh, a robust uh, NATO uh, presence which has uh, divisional uh, capabilities to ensure that an attack from Russia would never occur, that it would uh, just uh, make uh, no sense at all. So the decision that uh, you have made is a step absolutely in the right direction and is very, very highly appreciated uh, indeed. Uh, so um, maybe sometimes people say, um, is it right or is it worth it uh, to increase uh, investments into defense? And uh, I am absolutely convinced that for us as freedom-loving NATO partners, it's much, much cheaper to invest in a timely manner in our defense than having to deal with the uh, potential very negative con consequences of not having made that investment, which would be extremely, extremely ex expensive uh, indeed. So your decision and your commitment is, is spot on uh, and, and uh, very, very appreciated. Um, we both share uh, the commitment to supporting Ukraine. Uh, our country was uh, supplying arms to Ukraine uh, even before uh, February 24th. Uh, we understand that Ukrainians today are fighting and dying for the values that we all share, freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. And we have to do everything to continue to support Ukraine because supporting Ukraine is essentially supporting ourselves and uh, supporting our uh, way of life and helping the Ukrainians. Um, as democracies, I think it's, ex it's extremely important that we not be afraid to be strong. Uh, through combined strength, we can maintain our values and protect our freedom-loving way of life. So thank you once again, Justin, for the wonderful meeting. Uh, it's always a pleasure to look for ways how Canada and Latvia can strengthen our already very close and very good ties. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Merci. Uh, nous avons maintenant 20 minutes pour des questions. We now have 20 minutes for follow up. Uh, one question, one follow up. We will start with Kevin as the first question. Hi, Kevin Gallagher, CTV National News. This question is for both Prime Ministers. Prime Minister Carnes, you were on CTV's Power Play yesterday, and you talked about moving towards a more preventative posture in the Baltics, uh, where Latvia is no longer a, quote, tripwire, but rather any Russian aggression is stopped before they cross into NATO territory. Can you expand on what that means? And I'd like to know. You've t spoken to Prime Minister Trudeau about this, and if you've asked Mr. Trudeau, perhaps you could tell us if you're going to support that type of initiative in Madrid. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, so the tripwire defense uh, is, is a, is, is a uh, approach that was taken five years ago uh, that uh, would entail that if there were an attack which seemed quite remote, that, that Russia would actually attack uh, any neighboring country, uh, that uh, NATO would then have uh, the ability to slow down the attack and then to reinforce and to uh, retake uh, potential territory that is lost. What we've seen since February 24th uh, is that Russia is unfortunately indeed willing uh, to attack a peaceful neighbor, in this case, Ukraine. Of course, Ukraine is not in NATO, but uh, still the fact that uh, uh, that kind of uh, 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 an attack could happen is is now not theoretical, it's unfortunately very, very real. And what we are uh, arguing, what we have also, uh, I, 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 uh, we did discuss, is that the approach or the proper response of NATO is a political decision to, in a sense, up our capabilities to lower the probability of any such attack in the Baltics. And so when we speak of 
divisional capabilities. This entails a full range of, of uh, how should we say, tools uh, to be able to adequately defend ourselves, which is a little higher uh, a defense posture than we have today. Our country is investing into our own defense and will be increasing the number of soldiers and the, the, the types of equipment that they have. That's a given. Canada has already made a fantastic commitment and a, I mean, not only in prolonging uh, its uh, commitment to lead the EFP and sending additional soldiers and equipment, but today also to uh, start manning multi-divisional uh, uh, headquarters north. And it's actually through the divisional headquarters and beefing up now the divisional level that is a step in the absolute right direction. So we need to send, it's primarily a message to Moscow and to Putin that we are dead serious about defending ourselves. Don't even think about coming this way. I think the framework, the frame to remember for people is Article 5 means, uh, Article 5 of NATO means that uh, if the Russians, for example, were to advance even a single kilometer into Latvian territory, the entirety of NATO would mobilize in defense. But given the situation post-Crimea, it was determined that it would be on top of the Article 5 guarantee that it is strong and there. It would be good to have an enhanced forward presence to send Canadians uh, and other NATO allies uh, on the ground in the Baltic states to demonstrate that not just Article 5 is protecting them, but valiant troops uh, from the collective NATO, uh, NATO alliance. And that has held and been extremely effective and extremely important uh, for many years. But Ukraine and Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine showed two things. First of all, showed that Russia is willing to make terrible strategic mistakes and act against all reasonable assumptions and miscalculate so much that they thought that invading Ukraine would be easy and would be met by little coordinated response from NATO countries and other friends. Well, they were terribly wrong on that, but they did it anyway. And the other thing that has given people pause is Bucha is Mariupol, is the atrocities that Russians are committing in territory they occupy. And the idea that, that there would be even a, 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 an understanding that you know, the Russians could advance, but then we'd come in and push them back as something that is in any way acceptable would is something we have to recalculate. So these are discussions that we will be having uh, up until and at Madrid on how to demonstrate what we have been demonstrating for you know, the past uh, 75 days since uh, February uh, 24th and Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, which is that democracies are willing to stand up and fight for their principles, their values, not escalate, but be absolutely steadfast in the values that we believe in with friends who are democracies like Ukraine, but even more so than friends and allies in the NATO alliance like Latvia. Uh, for a follow, uh, Prime Minister Carnes, in your opening statements, you talked about how you're upping your defense spending above 2%. Of course, Canada does not meet that threshold. We're below the 2%. GDP commitment. So, Prime Minister Trudeau, what do you say to NATO allies when they ask you why Canada does not spend at the 2% GDP? Uh, Canada has continued to step up in every single NATO mission uh, that has ever been. Uh, Canada has been part of. Uh, we're taking a leadership role in Latvia. Uh, our capacity to deliver and to be there on the ground is significant and extraordinarily valuable to all our NATO allies. But we recognize that the world is changing. We actually recognize the world was changing a number of years ago when we put forward our strong, secure, and engaged plan uh, for the Canadian military, which uh, projects an increased uh, military spending of 70 percent uh, over the coming years. Uh, and in addition, in this past budget, we invested a further $8 billion 
uh, towards defence spending. So we will continue to step up and make sure that the women and men of the Canadian Armed Forces have the tools necessary to do the work that Canada needs them to do and that, quite frankly, our NATO allies expect us to do. Bonjour, Valérie Gamache de Radio-Canada. Euh, Monsieur le Premier ministre, je veux vous entendre sur la défense du territoire canadien. Il y a la ministre de la Défense qui a dit examiner la possibilité que le Canada participe finalement au bouclier antimissile américain. Euh, ça avait été rejeté, cette idée-là, à cause de, du contexte et du coût. Là, évidemment, le contexte a changé. Est-ce que ça pourrait précipiter la décision du Canada et euh, combien on serait prêt à y investir? Tout d'abord, notre position au niveau de, de, de la défense euh, des missiles balistiques n'a pas changé. Euh, on garde la même position que nous avions toujours, mais c'est sûr que dans nos euh, conversations et dans notre, nos plans de la modernisation euh, de NORAD, euh, nous allons avoir des conversations sur la meilleure façon de le faire, mais euh, pour l'instant, notre position ne change pas. Et puis, euh, sur le chemin à Roxham, euh, on parle beaucoup de, de négociations entre le Canada et les États-Unis sur euh, cette entente euh, sur euh, les tiers pays sûrs. On en est où dans ces négociations-là? Est-ce qu'elles sont au point mort? Euh, non, on, on continue d'avoir de très bonnes conversations avec les Américains sur euh, les ententes de tiers, euh, tiers pays sûrs. Euh, évidemment, pour les Américains, leur contexte euh, touche leurs deux frontières euh, euh, qui sont très différentes dans leur, euh, leur impact et leur défi, mais ils veulent essayer d'avoir un, une, une certaine euh, équivalence ou une approche raisonnable pour l'ensemble de leur territoire. Comprenons que c'est un peu un défi pour eux, mais en même temps, les conversations avec le Canada vont très, très bien. On est en train de, euh, de regarder comment on peut régulariser euh, tous ces enjeux-là et assurer que notre système d'immigration, qui est toujours rigoureux, euh, fort, complet comme système, euh, puisse continuer d'être efficace, mais aussi basé sur la compassion et nos responsabilités internationales. Good afternoon, Prime Minister Marika Walsh with the Globe and Mail. The Globe and Mail reported this week that Afghans who work for Canada's government in Afghanistan at the embassy as interpreters are being tortured by the Taliban while they wait for your government to bring them here. What is your response to this and why isn't your government moving faster? We've seen with Ukraine that you can. The reports we're seeing are heartbreaking and horrific. The fact that uh, family members and individuals who uh, supported Canada in uh, our presence in Afghanistan over many years are specifically being targeted is uh, completely atrocious. We continue to be absolutely committed to getting as many people out of Afghanistan as possible, get them to safety in Canada. We've actually committed to over 40,000 uh, Afghan refugees uh, coming to Canada over the coming years, and we're working very, very hard on doing that. But as you bring up the comparison to Ukraine, people need to understand situations are very different from Syria to Ukraine to Afghanistan uh, to different places where uh, we are busy welcoming people. The challenge in Afghanistan is uh, we, are, we find it extraordinarily difficult to ensure the proper security checks are done within Afghanistan because of the Taliban. Uh, and we are working with the international community to try and uh, make this an easier situation. Uh, but we need to continue to make sure that we are keeping Canadians safe while being uh, open and compassionate and welcoming and many pe as many people as we possibly can as quickly as possible. We've uh, welcomed well over 12,000 uh, people from Afghanistan uh, since the beginning of the, uh, uh, the conflict uh, or the, the change in power, and we will continue to do everything we can to get them here quicker. So are, are you saying to the people who are literally living in terror and being tortured that there is nothing more your government can do to speed this up? As I just said, we are doing more. We continue to work with friends and allies because we understand the difficulty of the plight they're in. This is a consequence of the fact that a, the Taliban, basically a terrorist organization, is now in charge of Afghanistan and are not eager to facilitate the departure of uh, some of their best and brightest to countries around the world like Canada. And we will continue to work with allies and partners in the region, continue to partner work with uh, Western and multilateral partners uh, to try and accelerate the process because we know 
uh, how much we owe to uh, Afghans who supported Canadians uh, while we were there to build a better future for them and their communities. Bonjour, Monsieur Trudeau, Michel Sabat de la Presse canadienne. J'aimerais poursuivre sur euh, la conversation sur la deuxième question de ma collègue Valérie Gamache. Donc, on sait depuis des années euh, que ce qui est à la source des passages irréguliers à la frontière par le chemin Roxham, mais c'est l'entente sur les pertes et blessures. On sait que des discussions qui sont menées avec les États-Unis depuis un bon moment pour changer cette entente, mais qu'est-ce qui bloque dans ce dossier-là? Je pense que les gens doivent se souvenir de la situation et de, de, de c'est quoi cette réalité. Nous avons un système qui dit que si vous vous présentez à un poste frontalier comme la colle ou ailleurs, et vous êtes déjà aux États-Unis avec une demande de réfugié ou d'immigration, vous ne pouvez pas faire une demande de réfugié au Canada parce que vous êtes dans un pays sûr comme les États-Unis qui ont un système d'immigration riche et, et, et robuste et reconnue par la communauté internationale comme étant adéquate. Et donc, des gens qui veulent venir au Canada essayent d'esquisser, de, de passer autour des, euh, des postes frontaliers et passent, par exemple, à Roxham Road ou à Emerson. Et nous devons gérer cette situation de façon à comprendre que c'est des gens euh, qui cherchent à être des demandeurs d'asile qui, une fois sur territoire canadien, ont le droit de réclamer un droit d'asile. Et nous devons, à cause de nos ententes internationales sur les réfugiés, à cause de nos principes et nos valeurs, nous devons traiter leurs demandes. Or, je comprends que euh, ce passage à, à Roxham Road représente l'endroit où la plupart des gens passent. Et donc, il y a des, des, du poids et des responsabilités additionnelles sur le Québec. C'est pour ça, d'ailleurs, qu'on a passé, qu'on a envoyé des centaines de millions de dollars au Québec pour aider avec les défis à ce niveau-là. Et on travaille euh, de, de, de très bons partenariats avec le Québec là-dessus. Mais en même temps, si on fermait le chemin Roxham, les gens passeraient ailleurs. On a une frontière énorme qu'on ne va pas commencer à, à armer ou mettre des clôtures dessus. Donc, nous nous devons de dire, OK, s'il y a des gens qui vont arriver de façon irrégulière, on peut au moins les contrôler, on peut au moins euh, faire des vérifications de sécurité, on peut au moins s'assurer qu'ils ne soient pas perdus et illégaux à l'intérieur du Canada. Donc, c'est une position basée sur la compassion. Je comprends que ça, ça préoccupe bien les gens et ça amène à une certaine polémique euh, pour, euh, pour certains, euh, certains partis politiques. Mais la réalité, c'est que nous sommes un pays où on suit des règles, où des gens qui arrivent ici, qui font des, 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 des déclarations de demandeurs d'asile, doivent avoir, ont le droit d'avoir une analyse de leur dossier. Et donc, c'est ce qu'on facilite. Et oui, on est là pour appuyer les coûts extra que le Québec entreprend, mais on est dans un, un, un contexte où nous allons continuer d'être un pays ancré dans la compassion et dans la rigueur dans notre système d'immigration. Et c'est une solution, c'est une situation euh, qu'on va continuer à gérer. Et donc, qu'est-ce qui a choqué concrètement? Est-ce que c'est parce que pour les États-Unis, ce n'est pas un dossier prioritaire? Non, au contraire, comme j'ai dit, les États-Unis gèrent deux frontières extrêmement différentes et euh, leur préoccupation par rapport à une décision qu'ils pourraient prendre euh, aura des conséquences très différentes par rapport au Canada que par rapport au Mexique, pour être honnête. Et donc, ces négociations et ces conversations qui euh, sont très positives, qui s'avancent bien, euh, sont, on le comprend, de, délicates à un niveau politique pour les Américains. Hi, Prime Minister Brian Platt with Bloomberg. Uh, what is your reaction to Pierre Polyev promising to fire Tiff Macklem, and just in general the way the Bank of Canada has been brought into the Conservative leadership race? Canada, and specifically Canada's banking system, and more specifically the Bank of Canada, is recognized as having one of the strongest, most stable, most reputable banking systems in the world, and Canada's central bank is highly respected around the world as being a strong institution. Um, 
the independence of the Bank of Canada from the government of the day is a really important principle that ensures the stability and the good reputation of Canada in international economic circuits, uh, uh, in, in international economic circles. It is something that is a source of pride and a source of stability, not just for Canadians, uh, but for Canadian businesses, for Canadian investors and investments, uh, for investors coming into Canada to know that we have a robust and rigorous central bank that is independent from political machinations or interference. The fact that um, one of the leading candidates for the Conservative Party of Canada, the, the leader of the opposition, seems to profoundly either misunderstand that or not care about the facts at all is uh, somewhat disappointing in an era where we need more responsible leadership, not less. But that it is, is a decision, obviously, for members of the Conservative Party to uh, weigh in on, not for me. Le système bancaire canadien, la banque centrale canadienne, la, la, banque, euh, la banque du Canada, est une institution euh, hautement réputée à l'international. Elle est reconnue pour non seulement sa rigueur, son professionnalisme, mais son indépendance des machinations politiques qui pourraient se passer dans un gouvernement. Et c'est un... Un, un, un pilier important de notre réussite et de notre euh, profil économique à l'international, que ce soit pour des investisseurs, que ce soit pour euh, des pays euh, partenaires commerciaux, que ce soit pour des Canadiens en général. La, 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 la qualité, le respect que les gens à travers le monde ont pour le dollar canadien vient directement du fait que nous avons une banque centrale indépendante de la politique. Le fait qu'il y ait un candidat à la chefferie euh, du deuxième plus grand parti euh, à la Chambre des communes du Canada qui ne comprend pas ça ou qui choisit de ne pas comprendre ça, euh, c'est désolant, oui. C'est un signe de manque de leadership responsable. Mais ultimement, c'est un choix euh, qui, auquel, est confronté, auquel sont confrontés les membres du Parti conservateur du Canada quand ils choisiront leur propre chef. One reason the Bank of Canada is in the crosshairs right now is because inflation is at a three-decade high, and polls show this is the number one economic concern of Canadians right now. What's your own assessment of the Bank of Canada's role in this? Do you and do you think your own is this a problem for the Bank of Canada primarily to solve? Or does, has your own government been too slow to act on this as well? well I think it, it is a reality that millions of Canadians, all Canadians are facing right now, a rising cost of groceries, a rising cost of gas, uh, is the rising cost in, in, uh, in, in, in living uh, is a real challenge for Canadians, and it's hurting families and causing a lot of anxiety. We understand that it's something we all have to work on. And, the government and the Bank of Canada each have uh, important roles to play in that. The Bank of Canada uh, has control over interest rates and monetary policy and ensures uh, that the decisions that are taken uh, are uh, going to lower inflation. On the government side, we have a responsibility to make sure we're doing things that don't further enhance inflation, but that also provide uh, respite and support for Canadians. And that's where, for example, the indexing of the Canada Child Benefit to the cost of living, which is what we did a few years ago, will ensure that those hundreds of dollars a month that show up in families' pockets, uh, in families' bank accounts uh, for support with their kids will continue to match the rising price of groceries. Uh, that's where we move forward on cutting childcare fees in half and, uh, and uh, bringing them down to $10 a day uh, over the coming years across the country, because that is something that will save families thousands of dollars a year 
without necessarily contributing to inflation because uh, it actually leads to uh, more productivity and more people entering the workforce. So we have a responsibility to be there to support Canadians. The Bank of Canada has a responsibility uh, to uh, fight inflation. We do that independently of each other, but we can do it in a way uh, that does uh, result in better outcomes for Canadians. Bonjour, Boris Proulx du Devoir. Désolé de revenir là-dessus, mais l'entente sur les tiers pays sûrs, je vous ai oui. entendu dire deux choses. Défendre l'entente et dire que les négociations avec les États-Unis avancent. Donc, pouvez-vous être précis, Monsieur le Premier oui. ministre, quelle est la position du Canada? Qu'est-ce qu'on demande aux États-Unis? On est en train euh, de euh, renégocier ou de, de regarder à la modernisation ou des améliorations à l'entente sur les tiers pays sûrs. C'est une conversation qui continue de façon productive avec les Canadiens, avec les Américains. Ce qu'on est en train de défendre, c'est les principes euh, d'un système d'immigration et de réfugiés basé sur la compassion et euh, la rigueur, euh, et c'est ce qu'on va toujours faire. Est-ce qu'il y a des problèmes avec l'entente sur les tiers pays sûrs tels qu'elle est en ce moment au niveau de la compassion et tout ça? Bien, on, on sait que euh, ce n'est pas tout à fait idéal euh, d'avoir des gens qui rentrent au Canada de façon irrégulière. Euh, idéalement, euh, on pourrait euh, assurer de, de, de faire... Euh, d'assurer que les gens qui viennent au Canada le font par nos postes frontaliers euh, officiels qui, qui ont la capacité de gérer ces dossiers de la bonne façon. Euh, donc, c'est à ce niveau-là qu'on est en train de travailler avec les États-Unis. Euh, mais, entre-temps, on est là pour s'assurer que les principes de notre système d'immigration, que les vérifications de sécurité, que l'appui qu'on doit donner à tous ceux qui euh, font une demande de statut de réfugié, euh, soit là. Et c'est pour ça qu'on travaille avec le gouvernement du Québec, par exemple, et qu'on leur a envoyé des centaines de millions de dollars au fil des années pour euh, compenser pour cette, euh, cette arrivée de, de, de réfugiés irréguliers qui arrivent principalement euh, au Québec par la, la, le chemin Roxham. Prime Minister Lieberfume, Canadian Press. I wanted to go back to Latvia. Um, the uh, Prime Minister Kerins is here. Um, and the Baltic states are currently asking um, NATO to both ex significantly expand NATO's military presence in the Baltics, but also make it permanent. Will you support, will Canada support that at the Madrid summit? Uh, this is uh, a conversation we had earlier. We recognize that the context has changed. Uh, where years ago, the Article 5 guarantee of NATO was seen as enough to deter Russian aggression. But in a post-Crimea world, uh, we realized, no, we needed to actually come together and put an enhanced forward presence out of Operation Reassurance on the ground of Canadian and Spanish and uh, international, uh, sorry, uh, multinational uh, forces on the ground in the Baltic states uh, to demonstrate our steadfast commitment to defense of all of our NATO partners. And right now, with Russia displaying spectacularly poor judgment uh, in its illegal invasion of Ukraine, we realize that uh, we may, we do have to reassess uh, the risk posture and how much we need to uh, stand together uh, on, uh, uh, against potential Russian incursions and aggression. And that is a conversation that we are having on the way towards, uh, towards Madrid, and we will certainly be having next month at Madrid at the NATO summit. Um, Canada is, is extremely proud of the work we've been able to do on the ground in Latvia. The Canadian troops, no surprise to, no su no surprise to anyone here, uh, have been exceptional and are uh, extremely uh, warmly appreciated by the La Latvian uh, uh, people for, uh, for being there. And we will always look to be able to do more, but we will do it in the context of uh, rigorous NATO, uh, NATO discussions. Chris, you want to say a few words? Uh, no, I, I, I can uh, add to that that uh, what's mostly important, it's not, in, in, militarily speaking, it's not in terms of necessarily the number of soldiers, but the capabilities involved in the forward presence. So this is what uh, needs to be um, uh, reassessed and what needs to be uh, updated uh, given the current circumstances. And what's extremely important is that we, as uh, democratic countries, as NATO, send a very, very clear signal to Moscow and to Putin 
so that there could be no room for a misunderstanding or a false assumption that something would indeed be easy. And this is what uh, is important and what we've been discussing. And I want to also ask about uh, abortion. Uh, yesterday, Minister Ian uh, said that you're keeping all of your options on the table with regards to protecting the ability uh, to obtain an abortion. Some have raised concerns that legislation could, in fact, have the opposite effect in some respects. And I'm wondering, as you're considering whether to legislate or not, what are the factors that you're currently taking into consideration? Uh, obviously, um, the primary factor we take into consideration is every woman in Canada should have a full access to legal, safe abortion services uh, and reproductive health services wherever she is in the country. Um, and that these gains, that we have that now, that right now for everyone in the country, not be rolled back by future governments or uh, future decisions. The best way to do that, as you've pointed out, there are discussions, well, maybe it's legislation, maybe it's not legislation, maybe it's leaving it in the hands of the Canadian Medical Association that has ensured uh, governance over, over these procedures for a long time, whereas a government like ours has continued to, as well, make real investments and uh, hold uh, provincial health systems to account where they haven't been delivering uh, access proper access to people, uh, to, to women across the country. So there's lots to do. There's lots to continue to do that we have been doing. And I think this is a moment where the threat and the potential of uh, an overturning of Roe versus Wade in the United States has women um, in Canada and indeed around the world very worried that there is going to be a rolling back of significant gains that they have made that we have all made in women's rights. Uh, so yes, people are asking a lot of questions about it. Uh, people are very concerned about it. And I am uh, pleased to be able to repeat once again that our government is unequivocal that women have the freedom to choose. And we will uh, do everything we can to ensure that that's not a freedom that can be rolled back by any future government. Last question from Evan. Good afternoon. Prime Minister Karen, uh, my question, first question is for you. Uh, today, your country's parliament approved the removal of a Soviet war monument in Riga. Uh, and I know that your country has probably the largest Russian population, ethnic Russian population in NATO. Could you just tell us a bit about how the Ukraine war has affected unity in your country, how it's affected your Russian population, and, and what it's brought to, to Latvia? Uh, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, so uh, the Ukraine war has changed not only everything in the world, also the situation in our own country. Uh, we have uh, a legacy of many Russian speakers in our country uh, from the 1970s and 1980s in the process of, of being occupied. We're also in the, being Russified, and uh, about 700,000 Russian migrants uh, were moved, uh, Russian speaking migrants were moved to Latvia in that time. Um, since regaining independence, the, 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 the proportion of, of Latvian speakers has, has changed and the entire situation in our country has changed. But we still have a minority of Russian speakers whose families came, whether from Russia or Ukraine or Belarus or Kazakhstan or, or Azerbaijan, I mean, from all over the former Soviet Union, who, until the war started, on, on the whole, had very sympathetic views towards Putin and the Kremlin. As a, as a result of history, uh, family ties, uh, traditions, etc. As the war uh, started, uh, what we've seen in our country is a reassessment of the former allegiance or, you know, the moral or uh, allegiance towards Russia and towards the Kremlin in light of, of the actual uh, atrocities that are occurring in Ukraine, as we see in Butch, as we see in Mariupol, as we see in uh, uh, Kherson, as, as we see all over uh, the areas where the Russian military has been or is currently uh, occupying. And uh, according to the, uh, the latest uh, polls, uh, that the, the number or the percentage of our population that still supports uh, Putin uh, has been uh, uh, going down uh, quite drastically. And of the entire population, it is somewhere around uh, four or five percent. Uh, so it's actually a small minority that still feels somehow that Putin is to be supported. 
my uh, uh, guess, I guess that's the best way to say, is that as time goes on, this percentage will be decreasing still further. Uh, so uh, uh, the legacy of occupation is difficult for any uh, country to overcome. In our case, 50 years of occupation and now 32 years of re uh, being independent once again uh, is, is a process that we're going through. But uh, what Putin is effectively doing is probably counter to anything that he imagined. One, he has solidified the European Union. Two, he has rejuvenated and solidified us as NATO member states, giving us new purpose and bringing countries like Canada and Latvia closer together. And three, he is not uh, 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 bringing citizens apart in my country, but actually having more and more uh, uh, citizens who've been living in Latvia for 32 years who still had the feeling that somehow, but, but Russia is, I mean, Russia is a great country, but Moscow is a, is a, is a you know, and Putin is a great uh, government, reassessing that and realizing that it's not that way. So it is a process, and actually, Putin is having an effect that I think that he never imagined, which is re-solidifying the democratic world, and actually, in a country such as ours, uh, to create a new understanding of what it is to be Latvian. He did this in the Ukraine eight years ago, and in a sense, through his uh, 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 occupation, and illegal incorporation into, into Russia of Crimea and his ongoing war in Donbass, he has forged, in many ways, a strong Ukrainian nation, which is no longer only ethnically based, but there are many Russian-speaking Ukrainians who are 100% loyal to Ukraine, who maybe 10 years ago, if they would have been polled, would have had equally warm feelings uh, towards Russia. So uh, this is one of the uh, unexpected uh, effects of the war. Thank you very much. And Prime Minister Trudeau, um, your government has supported Ukraine going to the International Criminal Court. But you've written three times to the court to ask it to reject Palestinian cases. Uh, the killing of Shireen Abu Akleh has led the Palestinians to ask the ICC to investigate. Will your government maintain its position that the ICC should reject Palestinian cases? I think there is no question that Canada will always uh, stand up for journalists and the importance of the job they do. Uh, the killing of uh, this journalist was uh, terrible. Uh, and we, like many others, are calling for uh, a full investigation into what happened. We're calling for a, a proper investigation. That concludes today's press conference. Thank you.